I organized this debate because I think like many people here, I have been watching with concern about um, the debates about cancel culture. And I think at this stage, it's very hard to deny that there is such a thing as cancel culture. But I think there was more of a debate about whether it's a problem and how new it is. You know, is it really something that just goes through cycles every now and then there's a more censorious uh, climate and, and that kind of thing? Or is there something that's you know, distinctively new about this, the kind of way uh, censoriousness uh, that is implied in cancel culture perhaps um, is being carried out? You know, is that something that's a problem? Or are we really just going through what is, might be seen as a cultural revolution, which is pushing for changes that have been too long in coming? You know, sort of pushing, pushing for a better representation of uh, minorities and a better uh, representation of their um, experiences and, and the idea of the, the, live, uh, the lived experience, you know, being something that really does need to be um, taken seriously and become part of, of literature. So um, that's the kind of general overview of the discussion, and I really hope that all of you, once you've heard the speakers, will feel very um, free to, you know, speak for yourselves and listen to each other. And out of that, hopefully, we'll get, um, if not greater clarity, perhaps greater nuance, something I think hopefully will be a useful discussion. Um, so, lots to discuss. And, um, oh, and the other thing I just want to say is the speakers will each have about five minutes to say what they want to say. <coughs> I've organized it so we have a writer, a publisher, a critic, and a member of the public. None of them are representative. Um, have their own opinions and they're not standing to represent anybody, but I just thought it would make a nice and interesting sequence just to see how the idea of cancel culture affects different ways of looking and um, engaging with the novel and engaging with literature more broadly. So the first speaker is Michael Nath. Um, he's an author of three novels, um, the first of which was a, um, shortlisted for the uh, James Tate Black Prize. And his latest, The Treatment, has received some very um, uh, excellent reviews. And I have to say, having read it myself, I, it's a really interesting, um, you know, sort of like very different from the kind of uh, narrative that you would get normally, but just very, it draws you in, in into London life in a way that I think is very, um, uh, very illuminating in many ways. He also teaches uh, both creative and literary courses on the novel at the University of Westminster. Andres Campomar, who I think you're a major football fan, writes things about football. I've written a book on, yes, the history of Latin American football. There you go. Being um, Europe, I'm a Uruguayan, so that's... that's right, okay. Nice, yeah. nice. Um, so he is now a publisher at Hatchet, UK, but he, um, you know, has been a publisher for a long time with a, a, a number of different um, organisations, and he's written... Uh, as a critic for a number of different publications, including The Spectator, The Times Literature Supplement, Daily Telegraph, and, and so forth. Jake Kerridge uh, is a journalist and a critic, and um, he writes quite a lot for The Daily Telegraph, or The Telegraph, I suspect, more broadly. And um, he writes that he's, I asked him to speak because he wrote some, he's, he's written quite interestingly on a number of issues related to cult, uh, cancel culture and how it's affected the publishing and literary. Um, worlds. And then finally, Ella Whelan, who a number of you may be quite familiar with because she pops up all over the place. Mm -hmm. And um, she is, uh, writes very um, cogently on a number of different issues, <coughs> but I invited her because she's completely and utterly passionate about literature. So she represents more the reader's point of view, but um, you know, she will uh, talk about um, her own response to the way cancel culture perhaps um, affects the reading public, uh, not just what put words into her mouth, but anyway, so that's our lineup. Once they've um, spoken for a, a, a bit, I might ask them, invite them to see if they want to come back on each other before I come out to you, but I will expect to come out to you fairly quickly after, um, after they've finished. And uh, yeah, so Michael, do you want to kick us off? Oh, excuse me, um, question, I mean, are we allowed to film? It's being filmed there. I probably not. I think probably prefer not to because it can be a bit distracting. 
but there will be a recording, so we'll put that on, on the Academy of Ideas website when we you know, do course. Yeah. All right. Good evening. Yeah. Uh, I'll offer a drink or other prize to the first person to name the following book. A landmark in the the most evil outpouring that has ever besmirched the literature of our country. The sewers of French pornography would be dragged in vain to find a parallel in beastliness. Michelle Robert. Really? Well, not yet. We'll, we'll come back to it. If, if, you, if you can think of it in the next three minutes before I come to the end, put your hands up. Uh, uh, it's not. It's not you. It's not well back. Everybody else. What, what, what somebody else say? Is it's, it's not you. I mean, here's a motto to cheer us up: the instinct, <laughs> the instinct of imitation, an absence of courage, govern society and the mob alike. And that's Proust, the Solomon Mora, published a century ago this year, 1921. Um, so. Can he be cancelled in advance as a writer by the cultural orthodoxy of the present? Can he be silenced, suppressed, ignored, or cold shouldered by that orthodoxy? That's my way of coming at the issue. Let's allow a novelist may now be suppressed because he or she, more often he, does not match the equality and diversity standards of academics, literary agents, publishers, judges of prizes, festival organisers, and what not. And let's call these people, let's call these the people who supervise the garden. The garden of identity. On these conditions, my particular argument is about style. It's a particular argument, you may find it's a rather narrow one, uh, I'll hazard that. I like it as about style. So a novelist may be suppressed or rejected because they write in a style that seems familiar with the novel in its modernist phase, or familiar with later novels, novelists who took modernism further. This being where the garden of identity gets overgrown by woods. Instead of risking the woods, your garden supervisors adopt a policy of suspicion. Suspicion of wild style, suspicion of dense or difficult writing. You can't be sure what an author believes, or what an author is up to. Best be on the safe side and suppress that. No smoke without fire. And this is why the market trend is towards a smoke-free, clear, tidy, signalling kind of novel. In this way, we can feel safe about the identity of author and work. The virtue of the one confirms the virtue of the other. And this virtue is signalled through the writing as a matter of lived experience, phrase when you do. This is why style is now suspicious and grounds for advanced cancellation. This is my argument. Style is suspicious because you can't truly infer from it an identity for orthodoxy to approve of or celebrate. I use the verb signal of the way the novel or the way literature is expected to function nowadays. Now, virtue signalling has turned into a common criticism of cancel culture. And there's a discussion to be had about the link between censorship and virtue in revolutionary doctrine, with the French revolutionary doctrine. But my immediate point is that, is that the decline of our language, written and spoken, the decline of our language into a signalling of ready-made ideas and sentiments is being noticed long before our present troubles. The value of literary modernism is that it resisted and resists this decline of language. How does it do that? Because its style refreshes, renews, invigorates the reader's relation with world and reality. The language of literary modernism makes the reader a partner in meaning, which is surely a human benefit. 
Why should a culture fear it? George's Ulysses, now in its hundredth year, was a novel that provoked much uncertainty about its author and what he was up to. In February 21, 1921, the two women who edited the Little Review, Margaret Anderson and Jane Heath, were those editors. They were charged with obscenity after publishing sections of Ulysses, an action instigated by John S. Sumner, secretary of the New York, so New York Society for the Prevention of Vice. At trial, the judges had trouble understanding the passages brought to their attention. So they invited Anderson to leave the court, just in case something horrid was read out loud, forgetting it was she who published the work in the first place. As a matter of fact, the judges had to go away and study Joyce's pages for a week before they were able to notice the to Anderson and he fined fifty dollars each. They both wished to be sent to jail, actually, but they were consulted by the small scale of fine. Anyhow, our culture has exacted its own revenge on modernism, exacted its own revenge on wild style. <laughs> From censoring the work for obscenity to suppressing difficult writers is where we've come to over the centuries since Ulysses, Sodom and Gomorrah, and that landmark in evil, which was Lady Chatterley's mother, <laughs> since those novels were published. Though it's not law, but ideological sentiment and cultural orthodoxy that provide now the apparatus for censorship. The supervision of culture was once a matter of social conservatism. It has turned into a radical attitude. Though its main qualities are instinct of imitation and absence of courage. The longer term goal of the supervisors is to cut down the woods altogether and turn the whole shooting match into a garden or safe space for works which imitate each other. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm going to try and do this without <coughs> cancelling myself or being cancelled. Um, but the short answer is the question is no, probably no. So I'll take you by the, what I call the kind of security street, albeit an abbreviated one. Um, recently, I came across a letter, an interesting letter, written in 1944 by Maxwell Perkins, that um, book editor. Best known for looking after Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, and Thomas Wolfe. And this letter was to the artist and author Joseph Pennell. And the salient part of the letter, and the part of the letter that struck me as most interesting, reads as follows The trouble with reviewers and with editors is so simple that nobody gets it. They ought to just take a book and give themselves to it and read it like a regular citizen and see whether or not. They like it. They ought not to apply their standards and frames of reference and all that to it until afterwards. And he goes on to say, they ought to judge books the way they judge people. When they meet a person and talk to him, they should not say he does not resemble some other person or does resemble him or make any such comparison. They just size him up on his own terms. That's the only way to judge. A pretty good assessment, I think. The idea being is don't measure unfairly, no hostages to fortune, don't judge too narrowly, maintain some kind of honest line, and don't constantly compare with other titles, with other books. This is one of the problems as a publisher, and I'm going to give you a slight, it's going to be a little primer on publishing, and apologies to those of you who know, who know about this. But one of the problems with publishing, or I mean, it has few shortcomings, is that, in my experience, everyone's got a view on it. I think by virtue of being literate and having been, spent <coughs> five or ten minutes in a bookshop, people think they know how books work. What they fail to recognise is the amount of practice or craft that goes into writing a decent book. I'm not talking about a brilliant book, but a decent book and also the hard work that goes into the publishing of it. Then there's the question of, will it sell? Good sales keep publishers and authors afloat. Because publishing, after all, is a business, and this is the problem with it. It's where art meets commerce, or 
if you're in the kind of commercial side of publishing, it's where commerce meets commerce. But the old, there's this old joke, which is kind of maxim essentially, which is out of every five books, three lose money, one breaks even, just, and then one recoups all those losses. Unless we forget, books have a very short shelf life, and I'll give you a good example. In 1986, Jonathan Cape, probably the most prestigious literary publisher, uh, brought out its cash, spring catalogue. There were 10 debut first novels, so that's tautologists, but there were 10 first novels there. How many of those 10 novels, and novelists rather, are still writing or in business? Any guesses? None. Two. None. Two. Correct. Correct. Okay. So one. The person I've never heard of, um, but is still going strong. And I mean, this is Jonathan Cape. So books are always, always lost to history. And I think when we think of books in the 1880s and 1890s, going from the three-volume, three-volume novel or the triple decker, um, and invented by Archibald Constable, which were far too expensive to the shilling editions. I mean, who does remember these authors? And really, only the best do survive. Um, and also, the other thing is that publishers have always been overly cautious, or there's always been caution in publishing. Victor Gil Ernst, who was Orwell's publisher, was paranoid in the extreme of being super liable. The libel rules were more stringent in the 1930s than they are today. I mean, he was terrified of being sued and losing money. So publishing has always been slightly precarious. I and mean, if you ever look at publishing in the first half of the 20th century, especially with the small presses, there was always the fear that the rug would be pulled out from under your feet and business would go bust. So there is, there is that, and I think there is that legacy still obtains today. Um, but I think about today, and I think about how publishers feel and what younger editors want, and which brings me to my point. They want different things, as do older editors. And there's also the thing of market forces, that actually who's going to buy these books. If people don't re want to read something, they won't buy it, no matter how good the author is. Um, it was quite interesting that the centre-right wing author, Douglas Murray, recently, who one would have thought would be cancelled, was published by Harper Collins and became a number one Sunday Times bestseller. It just shows you that if there's money in it, people will probably do it. And I think we'll probably put their, whatever their political leanings, personal political leanings to one side. Um, I think it's probably easier now to be published than ever before. There are more books being published. It's not a closed shop. It's diverse. So what diversity will look like in 20, 30 years. Um, is anyone's guess. Tastes change, I think that's important. There's always new context, new prism. Um, I was thinking about this earlier. I mean, I'm in my early 50s. When I was, uh, before I became a publisher, I was a, I was a lawyer, but if I think about being a 23-year-old, I would probably, my literary taste would have been probably more aligned <laughs> with a 40 or 50 year old at that time. A 23 year old coming into the business now probably has very different tastes to the tastes I had. Um, and I think that's completely different. I mean, of course, I mean, also the thing is, of course, there's no platforming, there are witch hunts, there's silencing. I mean, we've, you know, we've seen it all. To my mind, the problem is having a voice and not using it properly. And I think that's social media for you. And I always ask myself the question, having been a literary critic and did it from time <coughs> to time, you know, where is the criticism in all those piles? And I was quite interested to see if any of you have read American Dirt uh, by Janine Cummins, which was deemed to be cultural appropriation of Latino culture. Um, and I just thought that was quite a interesting way of not criticizing a book that should have been criticized. Um, 
Also, the other thing is that I see a tendency also of anger, of kind of jumping on, of not being able to distinguish um, what one should be angry about. And it, I keep thinking about Aristotle and the art of rhetoric, the idea that anyone can become angry, that is easy, but to be angry with the right person to the right degree, at the right time, and for the right purpose, and in the right way, that is not within everyone's power. That is not easy. Um, maybe prefer Seneca's formulation, which is anger is for a reason and the product of badly held ideas. Um, so the idea, can real literature ever be cancelled? Can the creative spirit of writers be extinguished? I somehow doubt it. I think you just have to be smarter about it. You've got to be less obvious, more creative, nuanced. And if you think you're being shut down, you just have to be clever about it. Literary history is littered with great books written in trying circumstances. Take prison, Don Quixote, Cervantes, Mortalfa, Mallory, De Profundis Wild, the censorship, Solzhenitsyn, various books, including the Gulag Archipelago, and close to my heart, numerous Latin American exiles who managed to create wonderful works of literature in rather terrifying circumstances. Lonoso, Aliano, Perigrosi, etc. And the list goes on. Thank you very much. Yes, okay. Um, having commented on the role of the critic, now is a chance of the critic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to comment on the role of the publisher, so okay, I'll get you back. But, yeah, well, there are many ways to kill a cat, and uh, one of the things that may kill literature, or British literature anyway, or British fiction, uh, one of them would be indifference to it from large swathes of the population who become disillusioned with books because they don't see them themselves reflected in them, people from the same class as them, people from the same ethnic background. Uh, that's changing a bit now. Mainstream publishers, they're encouraged by a very vocal woke movement. They're waking up lamentably late, some would say, to the fact they've not done enough in recent years to foster talent from writers of colour, for example. They realise that for years they pigeonholed and underutilised the comparatively few people of colour who have chosen to become writers. Uh, but by a process uh, familiar, I guess, to any student of public life. Now they're in this situation, they're overreacting, they're panicking, uh, not concentrating just on building up a list of authors of colour or a list of trans authors, but also feeling the need to censor their existing authors, to reduce the autonomy of the author in the process of deciding what can and can't be written about, to drop books, not just because of their content, but also perhaps because of things the author may have done or said. It's not merely the case that Kate Clanchy, the author of the Orwell Prize winning memoir, Some Kids I Taught and What They Taught Me, was forced to part company with her publisher Picador over allegedly racist content in her book. It's also the case that one of her editors came to defend her in the press. He said he felt on balance that they should have done more for her, stood up against her, stood up for her more against her critics online. And this editor was then forced to make a public apology for making this shameful case that publishers should stand up for their authors. And he had to promise in this uh, public apology on Twitter that in future he would ensure that in his role as a gatekeeper, he would not do anything to make writers from minority backgrounds feel that publishing was not inclusive. Uh, the censoring of writers on moral grounds is not new, of course. I don't think it's confined to any side of the particular divide. Uh, I was interested to read the obituaries of Sir James Anderton uh, earlier this month, the ostentatiously God-fearing Chief Constable of Greater Manchester, you may remember, uh, who persecuted publishers and booksellers non-stop in the north of England throughout the 1980s. Now, police don't do that so much these days, but that's maybe because they have other areas of interest, as the laws that Sir James Anderton uh, was obeying have not been repealed or altered in any way since his heyday. I notice now that book bans are increasing to the point of becoming rife in American schools, book bans brought about by right-wing pressure groups. A couple of weeks ago, we learned that one of the popular Biff, Chip and Kipper series of children's books has been pulped because of content that could be interpreted as microaggressive against Muslims. 
Now, many people have uh, gone online to say this is an example of snivelling woke snowflakery, this act of pulping these books. But one thing is that often many of the same people are perfectly happy for other people to be censored. For example, they support the decision uh, last week by the Archdiocese of Southwark to overturn an invitation by a group of teachers at a Catholic school uh, issued to the gay author Simon James Green. So those on the right who most loudly proclaim their intolerance of cancel culture pride themselves on loathing censorship, but therefore it seems their argument, there seems to be that their argument goes when they call for something to be censored, it can't really be censorship because they're against censorship. So it must be something more benign. So I think it's difficult to be sure of the direction from which cancel culture is coming. Perhaps nobody in this room thinks that censorship is completely unjustifiable in absolutely every instance, but I do think wherever it comes from, there is too much of it about these days. My own view, this might be an idealistic one, is that writers should write about any subject they like and that their books should be judged on their merits. Now, of course, it's probably never been the case that this has been uh, what has happened across the board in British publishing, but it does seem to me we seem to be heading further away from it than ever. There is also very worryingly, I think, uh, perhaps because it's not taken as seriously as the cancellation of current writers, there's an increasing intolerance for the great literature of the past, simply because it doesn't conform to the expectations of the present. Last year, I interviewed a novelist, a great novelist, I think, Dame Rose Tremaine. Uh, in 1992, she published a novel called Sacred Country. I don't know if anyone's read it. Uh, it's a wonderful novel about a transgender boy or a girl who becomes a boy. Um, and as she reminded me, she based that book on extensive interviews with trans people, with medics, all sorts of people. It took her a long time, a lot of research. She said to me her publisher would not publish that novel nowadays because Rose Germain is not trans. She acknowledged that it was wonderful that trans writers were now writing their own stories, lived experiences is the phrase we've heard, uh, which would not have been the case when she published that book in the early 90s. But she added, this is what she said, where does that leave a writer like me? Authenticity is to be prized, but so too is imagination. If we exclude from literature the curious-minded people who want to put themselves inside the heads of people totally different than themselves, it will soon lose much of its vitality. No writer wants to be heedlessly or accidentally offensive, but still the current situation will lead inevitably to self-censorship and probably to tough questions being dodged in books. And if anything kills literature in the end, it will probably be readers' sense that books are being morally censored and shaped. Mr. Collins tutted when the Bennett sisters read novels instead of sermons. If we get into the situation where Mr. Collins reads novels with approval, then literature will soon be in its death throes. Uh, okay, well, as the reader um, representative, um, seeing as you've all had a pop at one another, critics and publishers, um, I think I'd probably like to have a pop at all of you, um, because I think that authors, critics and publishers have um, lost their bottle in many ways, and that those people with the power in literature, those who you know, either have the means and the space to do the writing, something that lots of us readers would love to do, um, who have the means to publish, decide what gets published, and who set the agenda um, critically in newspapers, have lost their, at least, or have had chipped away their sense of independence and indeed their bravery um, in terms of bucking the trends, not being um, pigeonholed, uh, with all the excuses about um, needing to sell uh, taken into consideration. So, you know, I think it's undoubtedly the case that cancel culture is, if it's not killing, cult, if it's not killing literature, it's certainly um, got a noose around its neck and is tugging pretty hard. And there are endless examples that I could give you about, and we've just had a great list of some recent ones, about ways in which books are, if they're not being burnt, they're certainly either being pulped or removed from library shelves. Uh, and, you know, there's, particularly in America, as has already been mentioned, things that you thought never should have been banned, like To Kill a Mockingbird or Huckleberry Finn, 
um, anti-racist books that taught generations of children about the horrors of racism and slavery in America and now being pulled from curriculums simply because they contain the N-word, um, uh, you know, the kind of irony and <laughs> terrible action that would make Twain and Lee uh, twist in their graves. But obviously it's true, as Wendy you know, outlines in the blurb, that censorship is nothing new, um, that of course, you know, from... Lady Chatterley's Lover, uh, Ulysses, right back to other books throughout the centuries, there has been, uh, always been a trend towards, or at least a, um, a, a kind of powerful elite who have decided what books are okay and what books are not okay. I mean, from uh, kind of labels of seditious libel throughout the 16, 15, 1600s and writers like Free John Milburn having, um, being put in the stocks and having their ears cut off and cheeks burnt for writing pamphlets that the king and lords didn't agree with, right up to, um, you know, the kind of pe people who set the curriculums in schools, university dons, deciding that actually we probably have, you know, one woman is too many on, on this curriculum. And, you know, the rest of it, you know the story. Censorship has been a problem for a very long time. But I think that cancel culture in its current form um, is different to censorship of old, uh, and I just want to talk about why it's different for two reasons. First of all, because of the people who are censoring. So quite simply, it's no longer, uh, it doesn't tend to be priests and lords and royalty who um, decide that things are should or shouldn't be published or kick up a fuss when something's written that they don't like. And it's neither kind of sexual stuff or um, anything that pushes kind of puritanical boundaries that gets cancelled. But instead, it's more often than not Twitter mobs, or it's um, knee-jerk publishers, or it's people who are, you know, actually a lot of the time don't hold a lot of political or publishing power who get to make those decisions. And the type of stuff that's censored is not your kind of uh, radical left-wing um, or kind of progressive content, whether it be about sex or anything else. Um, but as has already been stated, it's more often not conservative stuff, old stuff, things that don't meet the current political, politically correct norms. And the second reason why, and I think this is what I really want to focus on, censorship is different today in the form of cancel culture, is because authors, publishers and critics, and in particular authors, aren't reacting to it in the same way. So they haven't got the bollocks that authors in the past had. They don't stand up against censorship in the same way that authors used to, authors that were jailed, authors that were threatened with um, being killed. Uh, and I want to just look at two different people to illustrate that point. So, as Wendy mentioned, um, I am a lover of literature and a lover of Joyce um, for lots of reasons, but not least because he certainly had bollocks and he certainly had a lot of courage um, he was a writer who was shunned by all the right people, by priests and prudes and people like Virginia Woolf, who, um, went after she read Ulysses, wrote um, this uh, criticism of it. She called it an illiterate, underbred book, the book of a self-taught working man. And we all know how distressing they are, how egotistical, insistent, raw, striking, and ultimately nauseating. Uh, so <laughs> about, you know, what, what, what a critique of Joyce. Um, he upset all the right people. And then, but actually before Ulysses in 1912, um, he, when he was, had just written Dubliners, his collection of short stories, he sent the printed sheets to it to his publisher and the printer in uh, Dublin, in Ireland. Uh, the printer was John Faulkner and the publisher was George Roberts. And having read it, and uh, uh, you know, every, everything had been agreed and it was going to be published, but having read it and obviously having had a few words in the ears from the right or wrong kind of people, Faulkner and Roberts lost their bottle and decided that Dubliners was distinctly anti-Irish, that the content within it went against the image that Ireland was trying to portray of itself um, in the early 1900s. And so they burnt it. They burnt, Falconer burnt uh, Dubliners. So what did Joyce do in response to this cancellation, this censorship of his um, work? He did several things. First, he left Ireland that September never to return. Um, so withheld his work and his genius, what was to become known as his genius, from the country of his birth as a kind of two fingers to them, sick of the censorship in Ireland. 
Um, second, he obviously went on to publish Dubliners and Ulysses and prove his greatness to all those who doubted him and all those who burnt his works as being anti-Irish or other kind of puerile reasons. But third, and I think this is the best, he responded with his craft. So he used his words and he wrote a poem, a poem called Gas from a Burner, which he wrote at Flushing Railway Station in the Netherlands, which is relevant because it's full of, talk about obscenity, it's full of um, rude slights. And it's done from the position, the voice of Falconer and Roberts imagining um, what they're doing. And I just want to read you a bit of it, not least because it's brilliant, but it just tells, shows you the kind of courage that someone had in the face of censorship. So ladies and gents, you are here assembled to hear why earth and heaven trembled because of the black and sinister arts of an Irish writer in foreign parts. He sent me a book 10 years ago. I read it a hundred times or so, backwards and forwards, down and up, through both the ends of a telescope. I printed it all to the very last word, but by mercy of the Lord, the darkness of my mind was rent and I saw the writer's foul intent. I owe a duty to Ireland. I held her honour honor in my hand, this lovely land that always sent her writers and artists to banishment. And it goes on and on and on for a very long time, but it finishes with this... <laughs> great bit where he's talking about Falconer um, uh, burning the book and he says I'll burn the book so help me devil I'll sing a psalm as I watch it burn and the ashes I'll keep in a one-handled urn that's a piss pot a chamber pot for anyone who doesn't know our penance do with farts and groans kneeling upon my marrow bones this very next lent I will unbear my penitent buttocks to the air and sobbing beside my printing press my awful sin I will confess my Irish foreman from Bannockburn shall dip his right hand in the urn and sign crisscross with reverent thumb memento homo on my bum now, it might not be high literature, but that's not what he was aiming for. He was, he was using his, and you know, if you, anyone who reads Ulysses will know that he flits between the, um, the kind of most base to the sublime in this way of basically saying, I am so much better than you, I can do so much more than you. But it's uh, a way of, you know, in, particularly in Gas from a Burner, it's a way of saying, look at what you've missed out, you idiots. And so the kind, that kind of bravery um, of Joyce, I think, contrasts with, contrasts with, I'm wrapping up now, someone like Kate Clanchy. I think Kate Clanchy gets too much of an easy ride because Kate Clanchy was an author who you know, write, wrote this book about the children she taught. Um, you know, it was very well received, it's already been described, got the Orwell Prize, um, you know, lots of uh, celebration of her. And then what began with just a few bad reviews on Goodreads, this kind of online website, some people saying that they objected to, you know, some stuff in the book that's fairly hairy, talking about, you know, kids with fine Ashkenazi noses and narrow-skulled Ethiopians and other kids with almond eyes and chocolate skin and an autistic kid that she doesn't describe very nicely, lots of working-class kids that she really doesn't describe very nicely. Her liberal kind of middle-class prejudice comes out, but whatever... They're criticising this on an online platform, very small online platform. Instead of ignoring it, she denies it, number one, says it isn't in the book. She then gets sent pictures of the book, and it all but cuts to become a bit awkward. She then um, repents, and this is the important bit, and she says, I'm so sorry, I'm a terrible person, I'll rewrite the book, you're absolutely right, and she completely bends and kowtows to those who are calling for her to be cancelled. And it's only then after that that her publisher turns around and bites her. And, you know, indeed, the, the, uh, one of the editors waited, in my view, far too long to stand up for her. And um, then Latley was, you know, it's always funny when people say they were forced to rescind their apology. I'm, I'm sure no one held a gun to his head. People made decisions about what they do and do, don't say in the public realm. And so, and then after all of that, Kate Clancy then whinges about being cancelled. And you think, well, Christ, I mean, you, 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 know, you didn't speak up for yourself when it really mattered in the first instance. And so, you know, what is missing in terms of particularly authors, and I'm not trying to downplay the, the issues of, you know, needing to find your next paycheck, not wanting to be at the middle of a Twitter storm, nobody wants to be like that, but to stand up for what you have written, this powerful thing you've done, putting out a book into the public realm, for publishers to stand up for it, and indeed for critics to see it for what it is. I think we're all now, rather than feeling the breathing down our necks from priests and lords and royalty, we're instead looking to how things are 
received on social media or on Goodreads or what some one person um, alleges against it. What's missing is courage. You know, we have sensitivity readers, authors, de yeah, yeah, finish yeah. It, de authors defiling their work basically by uh, inviting people who have no sense of what they're writing about to censor it. Um, no boundary pushing and no diversity. Everyone talks about diversity and really it means this superficial thing about what kind of identity you have in the makeup of your spring catalogue but not actually what kind of boundary pushing content within that literature you're doing so my challenge is that cancel culture is um killing in danger of killing literature if it hasn't already had an effect um but it's not some malevolent force you know floating in the air the people to blame are those who are involved in the process of writing reading and producing literature and so we all have to get a bit braver right thank you very much so um i think perhaps i'll ask if any of you want to respond to each other and or ella who spoke last and then we can get out to go out to the audience yeah it wasn't this it was about it was about editors and critics it wasn't I'd like to take Ella up on Joyce's bottle. <laughs> <laughs> you know when Harriet Weaver wrote him about Oxen of the Sun? No, educate me. Yeah, Laura couldn't get him out of bed for two days. Mm -hmm. He's lying there, trembling wreck. She doesn't like it. Because he had to answer to Harriet. She was band trolling him, didn't he? So it's not all bottle from Joyce's point of view, is it? That's the, I mean, people like... Uh, Harriet Weaver, Sylvia Beach, um, Ezra Pan particularly, and also sort of indirectly with the Little Review, John Quinn as well, are the people who Joyce was relying on. So that his sensitivity um, comes into play when they disapprove of what his work, I can't understand it, or say, you'd best rewrite this, this isn't going to work in the book. So there's a, there's a transfer of, um, if you like, difficulties, right, antagonisms for a person in writing in Joyce's time from what, what writers have now. I'd also say, Ella, that young writers, and I know plenty of them because I teach them, they find it formidably difficult to get into print. Um, and it's, it's not a matter of having bottle or courage, because they've got plenty of that. They've got stamina and dedication. They just can't break through. Agents won't respond to them. Agents just press the button, you're not right for us. You know, it's the formula message, that disgusting sort of thing. But it's, it's very, very hard indeed to see how they could find a way to getting published, no matter how brave and talented they are. Do you know what I mean? I do, and you're preaching to the converted. I mean, I wrote this um, little pamphlet on feminism that I wanted to turn into a bigger book. I got an agent, all was going swimmingly, and every time I said, I'd like to write this thing on contemporary feminism, and you know, I think there's too many pink books out there stalling its virtues, let's shake it up a bit. And the, the several publishers' answer was, this sounds great, but what we think would be better is if you wrote 100 Greatest Women in History and had Maya Angelou and Linda Bellis in it and blah, 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 and your heart sinks because you think cause you've, you've got no understanding of what I yeah. want. But it's, you know, that, and, and how, you know, your point about Joyce's, it has always been thus, whether it be patrons or publishers or whoever. But I think it would be a, you know, it, uh, let's, I'm not trying to be ignorant here, of course, a writer would be a fool to simply believe in blindly in their own talent, unless they're really fantastic, and there are you know a handful of them throughout literary history. That everybody wants to. There's a reason why we write books is so that people read them, and then and obviously the considerations of those of people around us, critics, and things like that matter. But I think that's very different from the kind of either the anti-Irish um, criticism that was levelled at Joyce's work for political reasons or the um, you know, cultural appropriating criticisms that are levelled at co contemporary writers, that's the most mm. often example, is very different from just a, a genuine literary criticism, which obviously has its, yeah. has its place well, in the world. Well, remarks are very shabby indeed. I think she pinched the uh, Ulysses and concentrated mm. it Mrs. Dalloway, didn't she? That's mm. what she did, and not very well either, I think. <laughs> but there you are. I'll come out in a, a second, but I just don't... I mean, I think that this thing about courage is a really important discussion. And I suppose one of the things is where does the courage stand? Because you do get the sense in, like, you know, looking at some of the early writers, um, of the sort of modernist writers of the 20th century, who had a pool of people around them who were 
kind of in a way giving them support mm -hmm. and has that completely vanished so are people operating simply as individuals now and sort of or is there a sort of like is, is that I mean I, I don't I think know they might, they might suddenly realize they're operating as individuals very precipitately and I think when you talk about Cape Country not having enough bottle it's partly because I think she would have expected that situation to be supported by her publishers and they didn't and I don't know how as an author in that situation uh, under that level of attack if your publishers are not giving you support how can you think properly how can you have courage it's the publisher's responsibility um, in that situation to support their authors um, as yeah, but I mean I agree with your point about I mean she did say that she hadn't written it, but yes. she blatantly had. And also remember the person who went out to speak wasn't her editor, he was the publisher, and he hadn't been there when the book was published. So he's just a voice. Yes. But then so he doesn't, I mean, say, anyway, you know, their kind of communications was rather at fault. But I actually, and I agree with you, I mean, she should have fessed up straight away. So and all, also, said, all said so, you know, all said, yeah, I wrote it. Well, I disagree with your interpretation. So I think she was bad. I mean, I will say the thing is, whatever you level at her, I think it's just bad writing. That's it. Mm -hmm. okay, and that just but, slips through. But, but, but yeah. so, so obviously there are various issues here because there's, you know, publishers bad, publish bad books. Always. Yes. yes. And have to but have also, a long time. But also they publish very good. I mean, that's the other yeah. thing you have to remember, that they do publish good books. Because that's why we're here. So, do you, are you sort of thinking that it's nothing's really changed? They've always published bad books, and they some publish some good books. Or is there a sort of like, is there anything different about this moment that suggests that publishers have less courage, or editors, there's more a greater influence? Because one of the things I hear a lot is about how young people come into these um, pu big publishing concerns like Penguin and start agitating from underneath, and their bosses, in a way, capitulate. Whoa. Let's see, it's, someone told me years ago that if you know anything about a given subject, when you read about it in the press, it will invariably be wrong. So when I read about publishing, I think, what is this? And this doesn't sound true. I think one of the things you have is, going back to my point of having similar tastes, when I was 23, I probably had similar tastes to, you know, publisher of 40 or 50. And I was probably, this would have been the early 90s, I probably would have been deferential in a way. I think people coming out of university aren't deferential in the same way. They do believe they're right. And I think that, you know, there are pros and cons that they do believe in their own certainty. Also, I mean, one of the problems may be is that they politicise the person, which runs you into a lot of trouble as well. And I don't know whether you see that at university as well. So everything is seen through some proto-political or political prism. And that's the thing. So they are vocal. But the idea is that, that this cabal, in every publisher there's this cabal. People, I mean, I publish, every, you know, from, from the right, from people like Quentin Letts, Rod Liddell, that kind of person, all the way through to people from the far left. And I've had young people say, well, how can you do both? That's my job. Can that's I my defend yeah. British publishing? On your behalf. You just don't need to. I mean, I'm very, I'm one of the very critics. <laughs> uh, just for, uh, we don't want to conflate Britain and the US too much. Yes, exactly. So far, Britain has not dropped the Philip Roth biography that yes. was just made. It did not, the British publisher did not drop Woody Allen's memoir. Um, it stood up for American dirt. So things are a bit different. Um, Kate Kanch is obviously a different case. But then somebody said to me, you know, um, J.K. Rowling's publisher supports her. They're not going to drop her. Kate Kanch sells 26 thousand copies, so they're, they're, they're not too worried about that. It's, it's, you know, they're not going to drop a million seller like J.K. Rowling, mm. however much the younger staff members Money agitate. Speaks. I mean, I suppose the other issue to, I'm going to come out to the audience now, but just to throw in just right now is that a whole problem of self-censorship and that's where, again, where maybe courage is kind of needed um, so that you're not censoring yourself. It's obviously mm. easier to say that. And so the courage also to write better. And we're talking about choice. And the thing about choice, lest we forget, is choice is exceptional. You know, we're not talking about a writer who gets published every year. I mean, these people 
if you have a look at the number of people who have published, I mean, over the last 200 years, the choices of this world, etc., are very few and far between. It's just because, you know, we have a Penguin Classic. I mean, most publishers have a Classics links. So you see them all together. So they become rather conflated. Mm. But actually, you can go years without having a terrific, or what I call a first-class book. OK, I'm going to um, go out now. So uh, let's start with you, and then you, and then come around. Yeah. So, yeah. Hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, speaking. So I wanted to make a point, because um, you were talking about the difficulties in terms of young people publishing. And I, myself, am an author. And I'm actually self-published, and I do want to comment in terms of self-publishing being quite a good platform, I think, for a lot of people who want to get their work out, and perhaps uh, because there's a lot of censorship and political censorship in the publishing world right now, and I myself am actually self-publishing a rather controversial novel, hopefully by the end of the year, which very much depicts a society, it's a dystopia, a society which is run by the Social Justice Party, and it kind of satirizes these two, you know, the very extreme, woke, cancel culture, and sort of takes it to an extreme, and then you also contrast it with this very this small group of white fundamentalist misogynists, and how we have these two big groups, and it sort of takes, I guess you could say, the worst of the woke left and the alt-right, and puts them together, which is quite interesting. Sounds controversial. Yes, Well, go on. and it's yes. like, if I, and it's funny, because I sent it to an editor, because I wanted to pitch it to agents, and he actually said, this is a kind of book which publishers would not accept because, and I, it was funny because I was thinking to myself, and I remember when Ella was talking about having courage, that surely a publisher would find that interesting, but it's like a publisher would find that so terrifying. But it's so much, this is so Okay, so what I'm going to do is, a, if you just finish your point um, as soon as you can, and then um, I'm going to ask a few people to come back, and then you can just pick up on the issues that you want to take up. So it, this is not a Q&A kind, of, kind of setup, it's more like, discussion among the audience. So just make a note of the questions you want to pick up. So finish quickly because I don't want to... Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I was just, yeah, yeah. I was just commenting on the, on the importance of self-publishing and how that can really give a voice to people who want to publish. I did want to say something about sensitivity readers as well, but I think we have to move. Nope. Just as a general, but sensitivity readers are something I do have a very personal general concern about, and I think that's something people really need to be talking about, especially in literature. I know Lionel Schreiber talks a lot about it. And it seems like we sh I don't think we should allow something like 70 sensitivity readers to become the standard in literature. I think that can really could cause a lot of harm mm. to literature. Yeah, it's good. We should be very aware of. Okay, then this guy, and then that guy, and then that woman. So actually, on that, on the point of sensitivity readers, um, so isn't that isn't the existence of such a class of people as sensitivity readers and lend weight to others' point about? lack of courage more generally and definitely within within publishing the fact that publishers employ people to uh, I don't know kind of preview the, the work and see how it be received by you know a number of different communities rather than you know relying on you know the author's judgment their judgment as the editor you know maybe the you know the people who have you know read the read the book Review the book in you know in the process of its of its publication. So it seems like there's a real hypersensitivity to how the book will be received and how it'll be received, you know, in particular sections of uh, society. So that's that to me says a lack of it really speaks to a lack of courage. Uh, yes. Yeah, I want uh, I want to talk about um, what you think is happening to the content of the literature itself. So I'm going to put a straw man out which is that roughly around 1882, about the year that Wolf was born, Nietzsche was killing Todd. <laughs> that, that period. So it's around that time we had Tolstoy, or Justin Tolstoy, we had Chekhov writing. We then had a, a, a progression into the, the modernist era, where you can characterize modernist, modernism in the arts by saying they still thought that um, things, were, things were much more, they realized things were much more complicated. You look at Wolf and how she does sex and human psyche and survival. You know, she's a complete genius in, in the way he's in the White House and all that stuff. You then get postmodernism, roughly after the war, uh, characterised by people looking for magical reality. It's almost as though 
reality, the real reality was moments of sincerity. And they were looking for certainty. Could you speak up? There's a problem with Yeah, sorry. So they look so in the modernist era, the arts were then looking for, for magical reality, if you like. So it's a lens of it. Gabog at Garcia Marquez type stuff. You know, which I find quite quite lazy. My feeling is that it was time to, for a reversion to modernism, or modernism part two, and post-modernism is dying. And I wonder if the it's almost part of the death throes of post-modernism that we see cancel culture impeding any progression in that direction. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, is this within sort of the American English sphere rather than looking to the, maybe the South American guy? And so, just think, how do you explain Welbeck? And you know, in France, those novels, and he's still a very popular novelist, and is that just because, you know, he's the last of those dinosaurs that's, that's so brilliant that they can't take him down? And I think the other thing I would just want to ask is about courage, because is it really that there's all these novelists who are, are very courageous that are just being um, done down by the establishment, perhaps you accepted, but in a way that what you're describing as those young people going into publishing, won't that be the same as young people attempting to write novels in which um, you know they're being shaped by a whole set of sensibilities so, so these, you know, are they themselves very much um, non-courageous or, or I guess you know, writing what is contemporary which will be you know very diverse very um, yeah you know, will be limited in, in, in where they are so I'll just take one or two more points. Can I just see who else wants to speak right now? Ooh, okay, that's all right. I'll take two more points and then um, uh, you can ask you to come in again. So that woman there, and then this man there, and then when you come back. Um, I'm so pleased you mentioned Rose Tremaine. I thought, for the sake of country, it's such a fantastic book when I read it. And I, I'm worried about the books that are getting written and the narratives that are being written now because of the self censorship, which is you know, um, part of the the water that we all swim in now, where everybody second guesses everything and thinks, should I, you know, am I being intrusive enough? Am I being racist? Am I being anti trans? You know, there's so many ways in which we self censor in everyday life that it sort of makes me wonder um, do we get the literature that we deserve at different times? And in, in a way, that moment, and one thing that Jimmy will call her own. You know, I, I take the points that we made about Jim Moore, she was right about, is that there was this moment, and it was a moment for an incredible um, artistic kind of flourishing and um, a time of great upheaval and great change. So the two things are interrelated. Joyce, you know, benefited from that just as much as, as Elliot in a different way, but it's more pessimistic. But, you know, these were great writers from, from a great time, from a great time. Um, and people in change, and I think also the 80s and um, maybe into the 90s, and I can think of lots of great American writers like Sherman Alexi, Gino Diaz, and you know, the sort of uh, people ch um, who were talking about uh, race in America. Uh, which is right, was, was that writer? Um, that Hugh Fulton? Um, the, the, um, Richard McKnight. Richard, Richard McKnight, you know, these kind of very exciting writers were being very brave and talking about these issues that we now sort of we now have closed down in a way and have made them orthodoxies and that can only be spoken about in a different way they were truly exploratory at that time so I think um, it's a bit much to ex expect individual writers to sort of um, to, to you know to break through all of that although I do think that artists can and but we can't look to them to to change a whole kind of um, kind of movement uh, away from um, being outspoken and being honest, and uh, so I mean that's that's not very okay. optimistic Thank you. way of looking at things. But I do think, um, yeah, just saying like uh, uh, you know, kind of exhorting people to be courageous in a way. Uh, you know, yes, we should be, but that's not going to that's not going to crack or break through. These, these are political problems that we have. Okay, so you, then the 
four of you can have, come back and speak on any, not everything, but just anything you particularly want to speak on quite briefly, and then we'll go out to the audience again. So, Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, well, I suppose what I wanted to say was that I think I'm still astonished in this day and age that people are denying the evidence of their own set of their own senses and what they're seeing. Certainly in our in our media, in terms of how reactionary the publishing world has unfortunately been shown to be. Uh, I've I'm very proud, proud to say that I started, founded, and have run for over twelve years some of London's largest book clubs, and I've actually seen first-hand the conversations and the, the absolute heartbreak that authors express in private over the overwhelming political orthodoxy that has swept the English publishing world over the last 10 years. Really, really, really heartbreaking. People knowing that the work they poured their time and effort into, where books are sort of contracted and killed and sort of left on the side of the road, knowing that they're never going to be published at all, simply because they don't adhere to the political orthodoxy of the time, all the sort of orthodoxies I'm sure that we could all um, talk about now. But the fact that people are still denying this, I think is really, really heartbreaking. Um, I was heartened a few weeks ago, I put myself forward to offer some development time, technical assistance towards a self-published um, competition. Um, I think there are some green shoots of a challenge to these, these particular political orthodoxies that are being developed now because technology is allowing alternatives to the models that publishers have enjoyed over the last 2,000 years. And I think, and I hope that there's, it's going to give publishers pause for thought. I mean, it's so self-evident. All you have to do is go on Twitter because the publishing world lives and dies on Twitter. And you can see so many of the editorial staff talking openly about how they view particular political issues. And writers know full well what they can talk about, what they can't talk about, what they can say, what they can't say, because if they're going to put a book forward in the next 18 months, two years, they know that if they are seen to be expressing an opinion or even sympathy with an issue, that it will kill any opportunity that they have. So I really hope sometime soon publishers will stop lying to us that this isn't going on, because it really is, and we can all see it. Okay, so who would like to come back now? Michael, do you want to? How much time do we have? You have not very long. <laughs> just speak, Freddie. Just pick one point you particularly want to take up. I'll, I'll be brief quickly. Yeah. So I sympathise with the fellow there saying, but I think reactionary isn't the word. I think it's a compliance. And it's a it's a pose of virtue as well in the fully sort of old political sense of that. It's a uh, it's a it's a self styled radicalism is the orthodox, not a reactionary one. But apart from that, a good reason. But one of those things that she's publishing herself. I mean, do you have, are you energetic in promoting attention to what you do, or do you have? I think so. I mean, I have a YouTube channel. Well, that's, that's what you need, I think, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's indispensable, I should think, if you're doing it your way. I do wish you luck with that project. It sounds fascinating. But, I mean, drawing attention to it, getting reviewed, getting it in bookshops as well, is, is a big challenge for self-publishing. Mm -hmm. Awesome, isn't it? Yeah. And that's, that's what you're up against. But I hope, I hope it goes well. The man there who's talking about um, the death throes of postmodernism seems to be a complicated <laughs> argument. But you said um, it's, it's what's blocking off uh, a re rebirth of modernism. Um, well, I'd better not ask you what you meant to him for much time, but I, I feel in favour of that, because I think the point, my point about style is that um, modernism is not a merely, not merely formal matter. Um, you talk about fragmentation, you can talk about um, interior, interior, interior subjectivity, blah, blah, blah. Um, if we return to that, it's simply a cage or rococo modernism we have. But if you think of modernism as a spirit, um, a general manner in writing, something like the Baroque as opposed to the classical, we, we, we're fully in, in need of something like that, and that's what I try to practice in my own work as well. It's an energetic, it's an energetic use of style, if you like. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah. come come back to more and more later. Just keep your thoughts in your mind. Um, do you want to address? All right. Where did I start? I <laughs> think, you know, Again, kind of... just one or two, not the whole lot. Okay. Yeah. So the first question. Um, it's that people are easily put off. And I think there's, it's, you see, we're talking about this one person. This one person is, you know, seems to be the gatekeeper. It reminds me of people who are told not to, I don't know, be 
apply for Oxbridge because it's not for the likes of them. The question is this, is that there are many publishers, and it goes to the last question as well, is that we're not all the same. You know, I do a particular, I do non-fiction in the main, I do a bit of translated fiction as well. There are people who do commercial women's fiction, there's people who do literary novels. So we're not the same. The idea that it's, you know, one size fits all. And I could give you a list of publishers, I'm going to your point, I could give you a list of publishers who probably publish your book, and not in the way that you probably want it. But the point is, it's who you're going to. Are you too well? You know, who are you choosing as your agent? You know, where do you go? And maybe there needs to be some, you know, kind of clarity on that. As for the second question of sensitivity readers, I mean, I'm not in favour, and I've never come across a sensitivity reader in my time. But you do need some kind of editor in the sense that if there's a not going back, I don't want to do a variation of the theme here, but if there's a novel on the river played, I need someone who knows about that area of the world. Because it's essentially what you have is a kind of acute editor. I mean, I don't believe people's taking things out. But they have to know what these things mean. So I think that's my... Mm -hmm. Okay. Jake. Well, uh, yes, I was going to put in a sort of good word for sensitivity readers in that if, as the uh, publishing culture pertains, as it does, as this man said, um, without sensitivity readers um, telling people and you know, giving them advice on what they write about, then more and more people will just give up. They'll feel... It, they're stepping into a minefield if they write about anything outside their own experience. So as the culture stands, they may be necessary. What we would all like is for um, sensitivity readers to have limited power to advise on things that they know about and for publishers and authors to be quite happy to ignore them if it suits the book. But isn't there a, a problem, though, that's not to do with this te technical uh, thing so much as sort of like a climate which some sensitivity readers are, have been created to respond to, which is they're more than just editors. They're more than just um, thinking about the quality of the writing mm, yeah. um, and the accuracy, but more to do with the problem of offence yeah. and the fear of giving offence. And, and by employing sensitivity readers, so essentially being instructed, we don't want to offend certain groups, that then reinforces a climate of self-censorship, where if you know that your book is going to be read by a sensitivity reader, reader you might feel, feel like, I'm blocked before I start. You might do, or you might feel if you don't have a sensitivity reader um, in the offing, then you'll feel blocked because there's nobody to tell you your book is offensive and it will be published. And what would but be... who defines offence? Well, this is it, sh it should be the author and perhaps with the help of their editor who has the ultimate say. Obviously, I suspect you know, many publishers um, take what the sensitivity reader says and just strikes out anything that might be vaguely offensive, which is not what we want. <laughs> However, I think as the publishing climate stands, a lot of people are going to be blocked, not because the work is going to be read by a sensitivity reader, but if they didn't have one, they would be worried about causing accidental offence. And there are all sorts of ways we can all, anyone alive can cause offence accidentally. It might be useful to be yes, told about it, and then you can ignore okay, it. Okay. All right. Uh, no, no, offence no, may be on purpose. I mean, I, 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 you know, offend, there's, nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with offending accidentally, but uh, you, know, you may feel happier if someone just says to you, you know, some people might find this offensive, and then you are free to ignore it. Now, that's a very optimistic way of looking at the process, but that uh, is how it could be. But, yeah, yeah uh, I, know, you know, I know people who have sensitivity readers, and they take what they say on board, and they say their sensitivity readers don't tell them to tone down the offensiveness. They just say, you know, you can make a trans character very offensive, somebody that trans people would not regard as a role model uh, at all, but just points out that, you know, what sort of clothes they wear, that kind of thing. Okay, um, so I just wanted, you want to say something, I'm going to come to you, Ella. Did you want to, were you about to say something? Yeah, also there's this idea that actually the author knows what they're doing. That has knowledge. I mean, this is a, if you've ever seen a manuscript, I mean, some are great, and some, but some are a complete and utter mess, and some need to be worked on. I mean, you know, out of that mess you can create something that's very good indeed. But the idea that the the author knows exactly what they're doing or that they're getting it right. And I think see sensitive, I mean, I hate the, you know, I hate the concept of a sensitivity reader. My thing is what you need, and it's going back to my 
Maxwell Perkins point is that you need a fucking good editor. That's what you need. You need someone who does a really close, smart edit. And that's maybe, that's another question, is has the role of the editor or the art of the editor, has that gone or is that going? And that's, it doesn't bear on the censorship subject, though, really, does it? I agree that they're necessary in this point. It's not a matter of that, is it? It's a matter of the offence, the def definition of well, offence. I'm saying a, a manuscript may be a mess, but it's not going to be a mess because it's offensive. It's just, it's not, it's no, not it's a very good piece of writing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's a different issue, isn't it? But, but also, the thing is, what you get, you know, kind of unclear pieces of writing is mm. the idea is not very clear. Well, it hasn't been formulated, but, I mean, it's oh, open to... Okay, so this is just, it, you know, it's, you I, I think then. it's bordering on the disingenuous to say that sensitivity readers are just, like, getting someone to watch a film when you've screened it to see if they've got, they're pronouncing the accents right. You know, um, it, it's not just a case of, it hasn't <clears throat> just been brought in as a replacement or an addition to a good editor to see whether you know something, what you need to know about the River Plague or whether you've got the geography of London right and you've set it in Dawson and you know that it's in Hackney. You know, it's not about that. Sensitiv sensitivity readers have been bought, and they're not focus groups that, you know, publishers have and things like that that have been around for a long time. It's a particularly contemporary thing that's been brought in to say that when a writer is writing a trans character, for example, they should be writing a trans character that is a, tr a model for trans people who are reading it. And that's nonsense. Our authors are not in the business of writing role models, or even in the business, shouldn't have to be in the business of writing accurately to convince the, you know, accurately in the sense of to please the sensitivities of readers. It's <laughs> completely a reader's prerogative to be offended to the extreme by a book, to think that it's trash, to, you know, not probably not to burn it, but to throw it in the bin, to never, to recommend that none of their friends ever read it if they think the writer's got it wrong. But that, that's the power of the reader. But what you don't, what sensitivity reading is about is saying, is preempting all of that by getting in, off, you know, one woman or one black person to come in and say, as it happens, you've written up the woman wrong here. You know, which is not only reductive in terms of, you know, what our identities mean and how people understand things, but it's also about saying the primary thing that we are concerned with with this book is about whether it's going to cause offence most often or not on Twitter. And that's what sensitivity readers are. And that's why they're a bad thing, because it's not necessarily about accuracy. But I just wanted to make a point about the content of writing and whether we've got you know, we make a really good point that, you know, we, we only get great books every now and then. And that's that's something that's true. But, you know, if you look at the kind of stuff that's being written at the moment, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a real sucker for, um, even though I have a lot of problems with contemporary feminist, feminism, with the kind of feminist rewrites of the ancient Greeks, so it's Madeleine Miller and people like that who are taking stories and writing, you know, Circe, or taking Shakespeare and writing the story of Hamlet. Um, from a woman's point of view. I love it, and a lot of it's trash, but, you know, it's kind of like eating boxes of chocolates. It's great, um, and a lot of it is fantastic writing. But the reason why it's great is because they are based on these fantastic old stories and myths. And, yes, they're being reworked, but really at its heart, the thing that's brilliant is the ancient Greek myth rather than what the writer is bringing to it. Um, so, you know, and I can't tell you how sick I am of reading catalogues, you know, that I go through trying to look as a journalist, trying to look at what's coming up to review, um, of p authors, fiction and non-fiction, who say, I'm writing this from my lived experience as, you know, books like Sugar Bane or something, you know, as a former drug addict, one-legged, you know, blind, blah, 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 I've written this book about this one-legged blind drug addict. And you, it's just incredibly unoriginal. And, it, and, ten, and, you know, a lot of the time, writing from experience is some of the most wonderful stuff. And, you know, in, indeed, someone like Sally Rooney, um, who lots of people are divided on, wrote Normal People, which is about an awkward young woman and young man's experience of love in the 21st century, um, you know, ba pretty much based on experience, it was fantastic. Why? Because it basically focused around the age-old trope of love, of love affair that can't quite get it on. So I'm not saying it's impossible, but there is this, I think there is a tendency towards, you know, rather than it being that we have this surge of young writers who are waiting in the, I'd love to meet them, you know, who are waiting in the wings to write all this fantastic stuff and just being blocked. I think there's a laziness 
that's linked to the sensitivity question, which is that if you just stay in your lane, as that awful phrase is, and write from your own experience, then you always can say, well, when someone says you haven't written a woman right, you say, well, I'm a woman, and, you know, and that's all that, all, the, all that matters. And you very rarely get people like Edna O'Brien, who goes out to, you know, does the job of a sensitivity reader, who goes out to Nigeria, you know, interviews girls who have been um, uh, kidnapped and affected by Boko Haram, does her research and comes back and writes Girl, which is an amazing piece of work, um, sensitive in the extreme, but also daring. Um, so it's not impossible. You know, it, these things aren't impossible. The question is, why aren't they being done? OK, so I'm going to go out again. Um, and ask for any more contributions. We've got a little bit of time, but I think what I'll do is maybe um, give the audience a bit more time now, and then I'll let you have a little bit, you know, more or less what time you want to, not exactly what time you want, but, you know, give you time to do a proper sum up at the end, and that'll be probably in about 20 minutes time or something like that. So, hands up. Um, somebody here, sorry, yes, you're first, then you, uh, then you, and then you, yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just want to elaborate more about the point of a lived experience and the impact of that on literature overall. Um, I don't think much in literature necessarily into mostly non fiction, but it's a debate been going on for quite some time. And I just wonder how prevalent it is, and from what you're saying, from this to getting it sounds like it's getting more prevalent and the impact on that not only on the like one leg disabled queer person and a very narrow experience that you can put in that particular book, but also on the richness of literature overall, particularly things like science fiction or historical fiction, and how that can relate to anything that people are experiencing these days, and also about the majority culture. So if people are going to write only about themselves in a country like Britain, 85% of them are white British. Um, does it mean that the majority of books are going to be published not about all the other people we live next to because these people are obviously living a completely different lived experience? Or if you are a black British person, are you only feeling or able to write about people who are like you, despite the fact that most people that you're interacting with really in London are not necessarily like you? So really interesting to hear your views on that. Mm -hmm. OK, is it yeah. Um, so, I have a, a question. Um, there's been a lot of talk about courage and um, fundamentally I want to support that. I also personally agree that courage of an excellent, strong editor um, uh, really cannot be unvalued. But if we are talking about courage, what does that look like? Um, is there a survival kit? Should authors be arming themselves? Should they be writing defensively? What platforms should they be utilising? Um, is it worth getting into a spat with a Twitterati? Or should they be mounting their defences elsewhere? Um, I think that a lot of authors go into this just having no idea what's possibly coming at them. And it's fear of the unknown and fear of what criticisms might be. Um, though, of course, I don't want to advocate for sensitivity readers, but you know, it would be like that sort of thing. Um, is it, necessary, is it necessary for authors to actually mount themselves defensively when they're writing or indeed trying to pitch a book? That's my question. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, and you want to say something? Yeah, um, you talked about um, sort of, yeah, uh, diversity and culture of operation, and also you talk about the sensitivity readers. And sort of notions like the right person or the wrong person, you know, is allowed to write about certain topics. You know, and more and, and it's a sensitive, you know, they've got the right sensitivity reader. But, but I reckon you, you might find that, like, you only look at superficial characteristics, like some person who, who whoever is sensitive reader or an author, you know, yeah, they might be the right ethnic group. But if you look, delve deeper, you might find, you know, where they had a very privileged upbringing, went to a post public school, top universities, and well, you know, well, they're, they're much qualified as anybody else to write about inner city. Youth, you know, yeah, their life is not even though superficially, ethically, they might be the same ethnicity, but then they're just, as, but then they'll be held up. Well, they're, you know, they're allowed to write about, say, inner city youth, but they're, yeah, they're not as anybody else. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, but they because they tick the right box on a superficial level, and yeah, so yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, there. Yeah. Um, any other speakers? Any other hands up yet? Uh, yes. Okay. Yep. And then. Okay. I would argue that the riddle to this um, problem of supplying the contemporary culture in the arts and literature are as they are with all this cancel culture cannot be answered from within the kind of sphere of literature itself. It can only be answered from the sphere of politics and what has changed dramatically in the last kind of 20 or 30 years. But it's not so much that what has changed as that what something that has been a long time in the, in the gestation of has now sort of come to life or has been sort of born out and we're reaping the we're, we're reaping the kind of you know the repercussions of something that happened quite some time ago. And it happened some time ago where you would expect it to happen because all writers need to be educated and probably to a certain level degree education and so on. But it's within the sphere of education that the most dramatic changes to our culture have taken place in the last probably hundred years. Uh, and if, if, if I was to kind of try and synopsize it and say what has changed so much, it is um, values that we used to have, you know, um, which are related to courage, duty, responsibility, judgment, particularly, it's extremely important. And um, those values at the turn of the last century were, in, in a sense, um, under question. And people like Elliot and Yates and many others kind of wrote about what was happening and the great sense of fear about where things were going. And um, those values, that problem manifests itself in society, not as, well, a discussion about well, what values should we now have and how should we sort of try to have new norms and values in society. It manifests itself as a fear about the socialization of young people. And particularly back in that time, go back to John Dewey, Dr. Spock, you can go through to all the psychologists and so forth who had an input into transforming their idea of how children were being socialized in early school, in secondary school, and all into third level education. And over the last kind of hundred years, that process has produced a group of people who do not believe in those same values that we had in the past. Particularly judgment is the most obvious area. To be judgmental today is to be a horrible person. But I mean, how can you possibly engage in the world of literature without being judgmental? It is, as, it is the kind of, it is the essence of what it is to be human, that we talk to each other, we judge each other, we challenge our ideas with each other and so forth. I think the speaker um, with the Latin American background, you know, you touched on it when you said the personal is political. That's what became obvious in that time, in the mid-60s, early 50s, the personal. And once the personal becomes political, my colour of my skin, my, you know, my nationality, my sexuality, all of those things become politicised to the point you know, where you're saying, if you say something about any of those things about me, then you are making an attack on me, on the essence of what I am. And you can't, you can't argue with it. You can go nowhere except into anger and violence at that level, and that's the danger we have in today's contemporary culture. That it is really dangerous. It's more than just a, a diminishing of literature. It, it has a great danger to us of kind of pitting us against each other in a way we never were before. Thanks. Yes, I think that's a really useful contribution in terms of doing a, presenting a bit more context. Um, and you know, the question is whether this is something that. Um, I guess it does relate to the question of the individual, how the individual responds in those circumstances. Anyway, yes, you want to speak? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about um, who are the offence, who are these offence takers that we're employing all these um, people to ensure that we're not, that no one's going to take offence? Because on the one hand, it, it feels like everyone is an offence taker, and so therefore you're uh, organising your um, <clears throat> industry around everyone potentially being an offence taker. And then on the other hand, you keep talking about Twitterati, and then someone said, oh, when you go on Twitter, it's all the editors and publishers <laughs> talking to themselves. And I just wonder, who is it, who is it for? Who, who is 
who's really the events taken that you're reacting to? Because it feels like there's a bit of an imagined community out there that we're all, you know, weak and scared and going to take offence at anything. And I just worry that that's not really true, that most people will read a book and not take offence. Mm -hmm. And yet you're talking to each, not you, but there's a community of people talking to each other and deciding that everyone's going to take offence. Okay, so, um, okay, yes, you wanted to speak. Anybody else before, and I'll, then I'll bring the, all, the um, panel back. All right, yeah. I actually just like to come up briefly on that in the sense that I actually agree that most people are actually not easily offended about these things. What it is, it's a very small vocal minority, and it's a mentality. And I also wanted to say, because I actually do think this is genuinely important, so diversity is important. I think that you like, made a good point for that about how diversity in fiction is important, but the problem is, as this lady mentioned, is that it almost feels like becoming so, like for example, in the UK, if say, actually no, it's a better example, if say most most people are heterosexual, that's just, yeah, statistically most people are heterosexual, and but there's obviously a small amount of, of people are homosexual, and naturally we're going to have more heterosexual writers writing about homosexual characters because there are more homosexual people in the world. And so are we going to say that only, only uh, homosexual people, gay people, are allowed to write stories with gay people? Because actually what we're doing then is we're actually going to have less stories about gay people. And I know in the romance genre specifically, in like the indie romance genre, there's a lot of women who write gay male-on-male -male romance. And is it going to become a point where suddenly these women are going to have to be better because they're writing men, you're not a man, you're not a gay man, so you can't write this. And, I do find this as something to be genuinely concerning because, if anything, we should be celebrating the fact that people of different backgrounds are writing about different experiences. And actually, I think you mentioned about the woman going to Nigeria. It should be the role of the author to go out and do the research. And that's how writing used to be. It would be the author who goes out and does the research because whenever you write a book, if I'm writing a book about a gay person, it's my interpretation of that individual. And that character is not representative of every single homosexual person in the world. And I just think it's really sad, especially as someone who has written, you know, characters about mental health, who are LGBT, etc. It should be something which is celebrated, and it should be about writing about the individual, because the individual does not represent the identity of every single person who's gay, or schizophrenic, or black, or has ADHD. And that's probably one of my largest problems with this whole idea sensitivity readers and identity politics and fiction. And as this chat mentioned here, it is very much to do with politics and with fiction becoming so politicized and it's like what happens to just telling a good story about a person. And that's what literature is supposed to be about, right? A good story. Okay. Okay, good, thanks. All right, so one person there. Oh all right, yes. Um, yes. I just wanted to make sort of a point about courage and social conformism. John Stuart Mill wrote in the 19th century about his fear of social conformism and how he kind of defended freedom of speech and freedom of expression because of this fear. We're all conforming. And is it possible that what we're doing with this sort of, sort of um, cancelling literature is creating this circular thing where we cancel the good literature and literature just gets sort of more bland and less courageous and eventually it's all very conformist and then a radical publishes a radical new novel that leads back to sort of freedom fighting and then we get back into this sort of social conformism again so are we just going through this again and again and again good um is there anybody else that i've uh, not or who's just sort of like a little bit uncertain about not speaking. Anybody who hasn't spoken? Um, no. Okay. So I'll take you again, and then we'll come back. <coughs> so, very, very quickly then. So is the is the courage that we should the courage that we should encourage uh, that of having an imagination? So taking the leap and putting ourselves in somebody else's shoes and writing that writing that uh, other character, and then obviously if it if we you know do a badly drawn character. You know, it flops, and you know, we, we go back to the writing desk and try again, and that, that that's actually the the courage and the, and the courage that should be expected of the author and of the uh, and of the publishing industry. 
Okay. All right. So who's going to start? Actually, let's do it this way around so you can finish. In it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, on the question of, of courage and how do you do it and whether there's a survival kit or what kind of courage do you encourage, um, you know, the you know, very important point about politics and the wider political context um, is relevant because this isn't just happened. If this isn't just one, it's not just happening to literature. It's happening to the whole of the arts and you know, uh, university education and all the rest of it. You know, the list of if you think the list of books that have been banned is long, look at the list of speakers that have been banned from educational establishments and other places. So it's a you know, the the idea of offence taking meaning needing to be solved by cancel culture is not something that's unique to the arts, so you have to have that wider political context. But I, but, you know, that, I don't think that every author needs to become a political warrior. That would be a negative thing, because at the end of the day, authors are meant to be, if they want to, if they're writing a political book, obviously, but, if, but at the end of the day, lots of authors, if not most of them, are concerned with crafting a good story, you know, about, about whatever it is. Um, and so, you know, in that sense, that is where publishers or editors or, you know, people who are supposed to represent them are meant to step in and navigate the, twi you know, it's, it's not fair necessarily to ask authors to be sort of Twitter literate. Lots of, it's a hellhole. Like, why would any of them, what, they'd never get any writing done if they spent their time on Twitter. Um, but there is, but that's not to say that I think we shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't be naive about this, that there is, if you are going to, um, write a book with a particular, um, in, in delving into a particular political battle. Uh, what I mean by courage is that you've, you've got to have the courage of your convictions to stand by what you've said and not kind of not be a wuss about it. So, for example, Laurie Penny has recently put out a book um, in which she talks very critically about gender critical feminists um, and calls them transphobic and all the rest of it. And a couple of people, Julie Bindle included, wrote some negative articles about her book, criticising her book. And she then claimed that there was a kind of universal personal attack on her. And she just didn't want to accept that her book was kind of shit and that people didn't like it. So, there, you know, that, that, that's what I'm talking about in terms of courage to be able to stand up and actually sometimes say there are more important, particularly for an artist, there is a more important thing than being popular or, um, or maybe even, dare I say it, cashing checks, which is that if you really believe in what you've written and you think it's very good and you think it's true, then you compromise that truth and that, that sort of excellence of your work by denying it, either through sensitivity readers or by bowing to Twitter mobs like what Kate Clancy did. And that's not me being insensitive and saying this isn't a difficult world and nobody wants to be in, in the eye of the storm of a Twitter mob. But... This is the world we live in, and either you, you know, engage or you don't. Um, but I also think that, just to kind of complicate my points, the, you know, the, the thing about lived experience, finally, and, you know, and its importance, is that, for me, the greatest books, you have great characters in books who can be very specific. So whether it is Molly Bloom in Ulysses, or whether it is Connell in Normal People, that's far too generous comparison for Sandy Rooney, but anyway... Or, you know, you can have characters who are very specific individuals who represent someone very specific. But for me, and I think for many people, the power of a great book is in its ability to be universal. So for that black, you know, queer character to be like me, you know, to speak to something in me, or maybe to not, but, to, but you know, to, that I can recognise something human in them, if we're talking about human characters, to recognise the kind of, you know, the universal things that we share. That's what the most, that's why we still get back and read Don Quixote, or why, you know, I'm reading Sholokov at the moment, and talking about the Cossacks in, um, you know, in 1917. What does that have to do with me? Nothing. Um, apart from it's given me, people are looking strange at me on the tube because you're reading a Russian writer at the current moment, it's not done. Um, so, you know, the, the kind of universal aspect I think is really important. But also just to finish on, you know, the, 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 I think one of the things about courage and about how we make judgments about books is we've also lost the sense of, you know, the artwork of literature, which is that the book itself is different from the person who wrote it, you know, not to greater or lesser degrees. But there are countless authors out there who are either completely politically suspect, 
you know, down to people who murdered their wives or, you know, did terrible sexual harassment things or were mad or cut off their ears. You know, artists do all kinds of things, but the artwork that they create, whether it's a book or a painting, whatever, stands in separation to it. So, you know, Sally Rooney is a really insufferable person, but she wrote a really fantastic book. And I'm able to deal with that, funny enough, because you can separate the two. I think if we start thinking about what it is that literature is, what, th what kind of value it has as an art form, and how that needs to be in the world of politics, but also separate, kept sacred from the world of politics, kept sacred from the offence takers, and have a bit of courage ourselves as readers, having slammed critics and publishers and the rest of them, to stand up and say, you found that book offensive? Actually, I liked it. And show the author a little bit of support. Then I think step by step will chip away at the damage that cancel culture has done. Okay, thanks. Yep, Jake. Well, I mean, what you said about critics at the beginning, I'm not in the right place to talk about other critics, really, and myself, but I, I do agree that there is a, criticism has become blander and, and less engaged, less controversial. Um, and now, uh, what you said about Laurie Penny, she said that those bad reviews damaged her mental health, I think. Yes. So, so this is another, another thing critics have to worry about now with bad reviews. Um, the question of courage and... Uh, it's not just the people who want to write about something controversial. People who may not think their book is controversial may find themselves in trouble now. And I know you asked, what can they do? Where's the instruction pack? I, maybe, I it, well, maybe a few years ago, I would have said the Society of Authors can help with that thing. But I think they've gone a bit off the boil. In, um, I'm afraid in, they, they, they seem to be not interested in, in supporting writers in that way. Um, another thing, well. I did say I wanted to mention again uh, what we haven't talked about so much is the writers of the past and how easily they can become cancelled. And this ties in with what you said about education, teaching people to use their judgment mm -hmm. and to be critical in the positive senses of the word. And um, I think one of the things that needs to be taught now, I did, I'm not sure we used to have to be taught it, is that you can read a book without having to like every aspect of it, agree with every aspect of it, um, to, you know, that book I talked about, which had this sort of uh, what were described as microaggressions against Muslims in, you know, even if you're a child, it should be possible for someone to give you a book and, and say, um, this was published many years ago, you may not agree with everything in it. Um, it may, you know, some people might read this and think about Muslims in, uh, an unkind way, but we need to learn how to look at books and get past that and say, I don't have to emulate the behaviour of every character. Um, and I, you know, I don't think people really did this, that you, know, you would read a book which had somebody say something anti-Semitic in and that would turn you into an anti-Semite. We, we never used to think that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, <coughs> I suppose it was about the future, um, and as we've said, uh, there is, the publishers are trying to be more diverse now in a ham-fisted way by encouraging censorship of writers, but also by encouraging more writers from diverse backgrounds, which is a healthier way of doing it. And this may be good news because, you know, when, when I talk to people of colour, they don't normally seem to be very woke. And so the more books uh. I've ever been published, <laughs> maybe the less work literature will become, but the, you know, there is a definite blandification going on uh, among the books I read. Um, there's an interesting book by a uh, Muslim writer called Kir Abdullah recently, um, and it was a sort of who's telling the truth story about uh, a Muslim, no, a disabled girl who claimed to have been uh, gang raped by a group of Muslim boys. It's a book that cannot have a politically, inc politically correct outcome. Either the disabled girl is lying or the Muslim boys are lying. Because she was a Muslim writer, she could get away with writing that. I don't think I'm exaggerating to say a white writer would have been allowed to publish that. Would they have even dared? Who knows? Interesting point to end on. Thank you. Um, so yes, I'll probably cover points already made. Um, I'm thinking about the safety pack. I'm thinking about a friend of mine, one of my authors, who's been reviewing for I think nearly 40 years, and said to me the other day, well, you used to be able, you used to get quite hard-hitting reviews, which 
you don't get the same way anymore. And the thing about it, if you're going to do this job, if you're going to put yourself out there, if you're going to write a book, you know, I don't, I'm not advocating, you know, causing people mental distress, etc. like my author, Julie Bindle, with um, poor Laurie Penny, but um, anyway, my thing is that you've got to be robust. So you've got to take the criticism. You know, you may think it's wonderful, your family thinks it's wonderful, your agent thinks it's wonderful, your editor thinks it's wonderful. But actually you'll go out there and you'll have a critic, and the critic who knows their stuff, and will say, actually, this isn't good enough, for whatever reasons. I mean, and a good critic will do that. And that's it. The problem with Twitter, and this is a whole other thing, is that, and I've seen it with authors, and I'm not on Twitter myself, and I would rather authors and publishers not be on Twitter. Because I've seen the pylons and I've seen it with authors of mine, etc. People talking about stuff in books they haven't read. So what they're doing is they're not responding, you know, they're not, if we're doing it in footballing terms, you know, they're playing the man, not the ball. So they're not talking about the book in question. They're talking about some ghastly thread pylons, you know, down the line. So for me, you know, that... That doesn't work. Also, I was thinking about societally, and also, what's the role of the author? And we haven't really touched on this. What's the role, especially in this country? What's the role of the author in society? Um, what role does you know he or she have? And then I was thinking also about, I think where it's especially bad, if I can use that adjective, is YA. I mean, I don't see the, I don't see the non-fiction. It's, it's basically fine. You've just got to be robust enough to do. I will do people from the left, right. I published Julie Bindle, who's you know views on feminists. I mean, some you know I, I agree with some. I don't, but that's not my my job is to produce the best book for her. Um, I think very literary fiction. You probably don't have the problem, but I think YA, and it's something I can't young really... Young adult. Young adult. Yeah. It's something I can't really talk about because I have no experience. But I see that, I think, where the problem lies, and maybe that... I think so. You're not in your head. Maybe you can... I can hand on the bat. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, we haven't talked about, I do think it's a forcing ground for some of the problems we're talking about tonight. And I find that students uh, too often... It was a great disappointment to me... If, uh, come through a, a sort of decade of YA reading and is still doing it. And I say 21, 22, you should have jacked this stuff in a long time ago. It's for nine or ten year olds, uh, they're still reading this stuff. Um, and it's a forcing ground for some of the issues we're talking about tonight. Uh, I had a few points to make about what the man, the one there said, and this woman, and, uh, and you said as well. Um, where to start? I mean, lived experience is a US import as well. It comes from critical race theory, and it comes from the standpoint idea in critical race theory. Uh, how seriously do you take critical race theory? Is it just a collection of slogans, or is it a substantial uh, scholarly uh, current thought or discourse? I doubt that it is. Uh, it's, it should have no authority over the novel or over literature anyway. And, and to come to the point about courage, uh, a question always to ask people who are getting, uh, trying to beat you up or get down, you say, what's your authority in the matter? That often gives them pause. What is your authority? Um, to, have, to have the courage to write about identities not your own. Um, well, to have the imaginative ambition uh, and the excitement about doing it essential. But the whole problem, uh, the word identity is part of the problem. This comes back to the man of saying there as well. Uh, once, we start, once we start entertaining and giving too much attention to the idea of identity, we're drastically thinning out what literature is and can do. Character is what we need to be thinking about and convey personality, not identity. Characters and human individuals, like I saw, fictional characters are more than group representatives. I've said, I tell people this I'm blue in the face. Um, it's a Stalinist, it's an Althusserian, it's a Leninist idea. The, the character represents the group only. No, it does not, right? Um, so get rid of the idea of identity and you start to find your way back to more substantial and uh, more confident forms of narrative activity. As, as to who is making all the fuss, oh, you said a mob, I think, didn't you? Did you I use that? It was like a small. Yeah, well, it's, it, well, it's, it, it's a pseudo majority, and it balances on the point of its own slogans. Um, 
the actual majority, I don't know if people know Burke's parable of the, the cows in the meadow. It's not in Re Reflections on the Revolution in France. I think it's in a letter of Burke's. Um, a visitor to the countryside is walking down the lane. He hears a tremendous din from a meadow. He looks over the hedge. He can't see anything except cows silently chewing the cud. Uh, a countryman comes into view and says, what's that? He says, it's just the grasshoppers. They're making the noise. And I think um, the grasshoppers equate, uh, in what I'm saying, to the, the people who make a great fuss and take offence about things, and then uh, are actually effectively frightening authors and shape, shaping the way culture is going. So um, don't listen to them. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's about it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So I think we heard a lot of different ways of thinking about um, the literary world, literature work, the world of literature today, um, without any specific answers. That's the, that's the nature of the game. I think there are a lot of discussion points that were raised tonight that need a lot more discussion. And so hopefully um, people go away and you know, uh, raise the points more among their friends and so forth. So I'd like to thank you all for coming. If you'd like to um, come to the pub, we're going to the Spread Eagle which is just down the road towards the pub, uh, towards the, um, <laughs> the tube. Um, uh, on what road is it? it Parkway. Parkway, that's right, on Parkway. Uh, so do come and join us so we can continue the discussion there and maybe sort of tease out some of these issues. Um, and yes, look out for the Battle of Ideas and the Academy of Ideas website for other events if you're interested.